Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some of the, work, the very recent work that we've been doing in um, canola and faba beans, looking at, uh, I guess, providing some fundamentals uh, to assist you in making decisions about if and when you need control and how to go about it. So I'll just start off with the canola, um, the canola story. And we've really been looking specifically at what uh, yield loss potential there is from aphids. There's quite a bit of aphid spraying happening when they're infestations. They look pretty nasty. You can see you know, those infestations you'd be familiar with. And we've done a number of trials so far. And encouragingly, the work that we've d both done on the Downs and on the Liverpool Plains are showing similar trends. So we have some confidence that uh, in doing this work, the, the potential to extend it uh, geographically is there. What is very clear from the trial work that we've done so far is that the compensatory capacity of canola is tremendous and that reduces the risk of loss uh, as a result of something like an aphid infestation. And together with the compensation, we're also seeing minim minimum delays in uh, harvest maturity. So the, the ultimate outcome of, of this work has been questioning the thresholds that are used currently and suggesting that perhaps they're a little too conservative for what we're seeing in terms of, of impact. Generally, you know, sort of between 10 and 20% of racines infested seems to be what people use. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in relaxing on the thresholds and being a little bit more aware of how much the crop can compensate, particularly under good conditions, there really is an opportunity, I think, to harness the, the contribution that natural enemies make to controlling aphid populations, particularly late in the season. So just to give you a quick visual on, the, on how quickly and how completely um, canola can compensate for damage during flowering, this, these are just some quick snaps from uh, one of the trials on the Liverpool Plains. And probably this one is most illustrative where we, we removed the entire racine, the primary racemes, and then within 15 days or two weeks, we were seeing those laterals almost completely compensating for the, the earlier loss. Now, the, the type of damage that we've been inflicting is simulated damage. We're unable to use aphids. We're unable to get them to uniformly infest plots in a replicated trial the way we want them to. And where we do, do our, have attempted artificial infestations, the natural enemies turn up and devastate those populations. But we have some level of confidence that what we're doing in terms of removing portions of the plant is not too far from, and the response that we get in the crop is not too far from what happens n naturally. So here you can see an early infestation on, a, on one of the primary racemes and the development of those laterals in response to that, which is exactly the sort of uh, plant response that we're getting uh, with our simulated damage trials. My particular interest in this work was how much are you losing with those late infestations, which are probably the ones that get sprayed most frequently, particularly in the northern part of um, of New South Wales and southern Queensland, and at that 10 to 20 per cent infestation, how much are you actually losing when you, um, if you don't protect those late flowers and, and, um, and small pods? So what I'm talking about is this sort of infestation late in the season where the bulk of the, the raceme has potted up well, and you've got this colony of aphids developing here and clearly impinging on the development of those pods. So what we did here was we went, we had a replicated trial where we actually, re we had an undamaged control. We removed 10% of the terminals, 50% uh, and 90%. And what this graph shows you is that there was no significant difference in the yield across those different treatments. So I think that that gives you some considerable confidence that um, the contribution of this very late flowering, so this damage was inflicted at um, about 23 days after first flowering. So almost towards the end of flowering. One of the challenges with picking where you can be fairly confident that the crop has reached the end of flowering is what's the season going to do? So you know that 23 days is by no means fixed. If you're further south and the flowering period is longer, that might be 30 days or 35 days. So it's just that concept that as you get towards the end of the, fit, to, to the, end of the season, you need to be aware that you're not going to realise every flower to a, a harvestable pod and, and to sort of overlay that with you know, what might look like a fairly uh, unpleasant infestation of aphids. The, uh, the earlier trial work, the, the damage to um, in earlier, part, earlier flowering periods, I guess is um, 
is the other part of this work. And so we've done this trial at a number of sites. The reason we did it at a number of sites was to try and pick up on the impact of soil moisture and crop maturity, et cetera. Um, and what you can see here is we remove quite substantial portions of those raised seams, so in the different treatments. And it wasn't until we inflicted very severe damage where we removed pretty much every raised seam on that plant that we saw a, a decline in yield. So that's the compensation by the laterals. It may also be um, you know, where we have removed portions of, of the pods, the ones that are left are setting um, pods that may be compensating. But we haven't examined the data in that way to see whether there's you know, interpod uh, compensation as well as additional branching compensation. We did that trial a little bit later on the downs the, the previous year and the trend was almost identical for, um, for that trial. So I guess what that suggests to us is that you know, the compensative capacity is not fixed by um, by available moisture necessarily or by where you are in the season length. So there are other things happening in those infestations that's important to factor into your decision making. Um, a lot of spraying happens as the populations are peaking when they're looking at their worst. But a close in, on close inspection you'll see that there's a bit happening in those aphid infestations and parasitism is one of the major causes of um, colony collapse uh, in, in aphids. It's um, this small wasp that does it and it takes about 10 days from the time they sting the aphid until the aphid actually blows up and you can see that it's parasitised. And that's why you get that sort of exponential growth uh, in, um, in parasitism. So from one week to the next you can go from seeing very little to pretty much every aphid in the colony affected. So it's important to take a close look to see in addition to what sort of numbers what actually is happening in that crop in relation to natural enemy activity. <clears throat> Once you start to see good numbers of parasitised aphids, you can be pretty sure that that colony is on its way out. I just want to mention very briefly the, the, uh, the interaction of aphids and virus. Beet western yellows was a big issue in southern Australia uh, last year. Um, there's an information sheet which makes some suggestions about how you might approach that if you're in an area where you get beet western yellows or you have some experience with beet western yellows. But there are some, some sort of fundamentals. Uh, there's no virus without aphids. The virus has to be transmitted by the aphids and not every aphid that you see in the crop will be transmitting virus. We know that we get green peach aphid in the northern region. Uh, it's generally there until the temperatures start to warm up in spring and that's the primary vector of beet western yellows. But by the time you see the aphids, they've more than likely transmitted the virus. So is there any point in attempting to control them? Well, a seed dressing in an, in an area where you, you know, your risk is high is a good strategy because it may not kill the, first, the aphid the first time it feeds, but it will reduce the incidence of, it, of um, infestation, so the overall level of infection, because it will kill the aphid before it has an opportunity to A, reproduce and produce young that are infected, but also that movement from plant to plant. So there is some benefit, we think, in using a neonicotinoid seed dressing to reduce the risk of uh, that happening early in the season. So moving on to the Faber beam work that we've been doing, um, our interest has been in, I guess, addressing some of the concerns that agronomists have around the threshold, perhaps not delivering reliable results in terms of preventing downgrades um, at delivery. And I'll just put this slide up to show you some of the things that I think are of concern. The first is, um, the sort of damage that Healy's seem to do in Faber beans is much more, um, well, so it seems to be excessively damaging compared with the way they behave in other pulse crops. They seem to do a lot of preliminary feeding in contrast to the amount of actual seed damage that they do. And that damage, um, the penetration of the pod, allows secondary infections, bacteria and fungi to enter, which contribute probably to the discoloration of the seed coat and so on. I know that there's a sort of general rule of thumb that you don't worry about healies until you've got pods, but from the trial work that we were doing, one of the observations I made was when there, when there were large populations of helicoverpera at flowering, we were getting significant damage to flowers. And um, so what they're doing here, this is targeting the pollen sacs, and here this damage is to the ovule. So in both those cases, the flowers are essentially aborted. And cumulatively, this sort of damage can have quite a big impact on that translation from flowers to pods. 
Um, and whilst you know, the general consensus is there are way too many flowers, I think that it's just another contributor to that poor uh, flower to pod conversion that um, it may be worth keeping an eye on. So does helicoverpa damage, or what the, uh, on your receival slip says insect damage, really drive um, gradings? We collected quite a bit of data from uh, one of the, one of the uh, seed companies this year to look at what had happened sort of over the last uh, three or four years in terms of how they had graded um, faber bean samples. And what you can see here, the thing that stands out the most is that for these different grades from one to three, there is a huge overlap in the amount of, in the number of samples that uh, were scored with insect damage. So that tells you immediately that insect damage is not driving or we would see, you know, sort of a, a much steeper um, curve here on, on that damage. So what is driving um, the grading uh, in terms of that data that we collected from those 83 receival slips that we analysed? This is the ranking, so broken and damaged grain is the primary um, the primary factor. Insects are second, but I guess in terms of what we see with the sort of uh, secondary infection and that excessive pod damage and uh, potential for quality downgrades as a result of helicoverpa activity, I just wonder whether in addition to insect damage some of this weathering and poor colour may be um, sheeted back to helicoverpa as well. We don't know that yet, but certainly the focus of our work now will not be around uh, how many kilos per hectare helicoverpa removed from your field if you're growing faba beans, but certainly what percentage of, of damage and yield, um, uh, not yield, but quality downgrade you might incur as a result of those infestations. We're going to change our, shift our focus from a yield-based threshold to a quality-based threshold because it's very clear that you're hitting that quality, uh, those quality issues well before you, you're losing substantial yield. But to prevent either of those, you need to be able to sample effectively. And this year we had a look at, you know, the relative of F, last year we had a look at the relative efficiency of the beet sheet and the sweep net. And it may not be much of a surprise to you, but we did this work where we sampled with either a beet sheet or a sweep net, and then that portion of the crop that we had sampled, we, we cut and checked to see what was left, and that made up the total um, of what was there. And so this data is presented in terms of what percentage of that total we were finding with either of those two methods. So you can see in the grey bars, the beet sheet, very poor down this end, less than sort of 50% of those small larvae are being detected. The sweep net, even worse. When we get to the larger larvae, the beet sheet's dislodging them fairly well, the sweep net much less well. Now, how much, what proportion is removed is not as important as the reliability, and we need to do a lot more work to see how reliable, know whether that pattern remains the same across crops and across different um, you know, stages from flowering right through to potting. But what is, I guess, of most concern to me is this here with the beet sheet, that these these stages where you're wanting to know what's there and make your decisions about whether you need to implement control before you get medium and large larvae that will do pod damage, is that you know, we're just not finding those larvae uh, very well or um, you know, particularly at low densities, I think the chance of finding them is even lower. So what's going on? Well, when we dissect the plants out to say, well, why aren't we getting them in our sweet net and on our beet sheets? Why aren't we dislodging those small larvae easily? The answer is here that they're predominantly at the top of the plant. So in those flowers, buds, uh, the more complex structures and the terminals. And that data there tells you uh, a little bit more about that. And this is fairly typical of what, what we were seeing. You tease open the, the, uh, the terminal and there's a very small, or small larva feeding on those early forming buds. So the upshot of that is that it doesn't really matter whether you, you're sampling with a sweep net or a beet sheet, but you should be including a visual inspection of those terminals so that you have a heads up on what's coming through and that you, um, you, know, you at least can, can get back to that field to sample again to see what small mediums or mediums are coming through and get your timing spot on if you need to control to prevent that, um, that pod damage. We haven't done very much work looking at uh, what the different uh, available control options are doing. Uh, we've done one replicated trial and there was nothing very exciting to report. Everything 
you know, did what we expected it to do. But I thought it was probably worth mentioning uh, NPV or Vivus Max is probably the product that you're familiar with from sorghum. Might be not, may not be something that you immediately think of in terms of uh, putting it onto, onto uh, faber beans, but to my mind it has a very good fit in faber beans. Faber beans is quite a long flowering potting uh, period. There are lots of natural enemies there. The potential for them to contribute to helicoverpa control and, and perhaps some of the other things uh, is great and to disrupt that with a synthetic pyrethroid or perhaps less so with a steward um, is uh, sort of counterproductive. However, we did a trial, we included NPV and NPV in the cold of um, sort of, uh, of uh, favour beam flowering period just did not perform how we expected. And just to explain that, these are the days after infection. We, we actually went back to the lab and had a look at why was it taking so long? Why weren't they dying in the field? We were bringing them back to the lab and warming them up and they were dying pretty smartly. So what was going on? And the answer is, is in the impact of temperature. It's probably much greater than we ever envisaged because for the most part, most people's experience has been in sorghum where it's relatively warm. So the black line, um, this is sort of the percentage of more cumulative mortality. The black line is pretty much what you might be used to in, in sorghum. You put it on and within sort of seven, eight, ten days, the majority of the population is dead. When we put the population in at 15 degrees, we did not get to those levels of mortality until we were sort of three weeks out. So three, it extended from sort of a week to three weeks before we got reasonable mortality. At 10 degrees, the larvae just did nothing. But just to reinforce it, there was no problem with an acquisition of an infection. It was just the time, the temperature slowed everything so, so much that everything was extended. Those 10 degree larvae at 10 degrees did absolutely nothing. At 20, uh, what was it, about 21 days, we took them out of the 10 degree incubator because we felt so sorry for them, put them in at 25 degrees and immediately the mortality rocketed. So it's just a, a caution, and I guess in terms of how might you use NPV, I think it has a very good fit in terms of a way to establish an, infesta an, an infection, something that you might consider putting on when you're going over with a, uh, a fungicide, for example, to establish that infection that might be taking out those small larvae before you even start to see them on your beet sheet or in your sweep net. Um, and uh, I doubt that, you know, given the sort of temperatures that generally persist when you're trying to control helicoverpa in favour beans, that it would be something that you would use instead of a steward or, or a, a synthetic pyrethroid, you know, when you really need that knockdown control. But um, I think the contribution that it can make in terms of reducing the risk of getting large larvae damaging pods is there. One of the other things that we had a quick look at uh, was green myriads. There were lots of green myriads in crops last year, uh, breeding uh, in quite high densities, up to sort of 14, I guess somewhere between 10 and uh, 15 per square metre in some instances. And, and the agronomists used to checking things like mung beans were quite alarmed at, um, at their presence and wanted to know what they were doing and nobody knew. So we had a quick look to see, you know, do they actually have the potential to cause any damage? And we just looked at pods, so we caged uh, adult myriads on, on developing pods, um, well, sort of maturing pods almost, filling and maturing. And we left them there for seven days and then we harvested half of those pods green and we looked at them and we could see no sign. It was very different from what we tend to see in, in mung beans or what we tend to see in cotton where you get that necrosis, that sort of dead wet spot where they've been feeding. We saw none of those signs and we thought, oh, th that's funny. Um, the other half we went back and harvested at maturity and it was only when we harvested them at maturity and we got these um, seeds back that we could see what they had been doing and in fact they have fed on those developing seed and they have left quite uh, significant discoloration on that seed coat and off the downs this year there were some loads that were downgraded as a result of damage like this that no one really knew what had, caught, what it, what had been the cause and it was they weren't sure what category to put it in. Um, so I think, I mean, I don't have any suggestions for you at this point as to a threshold or um, when the sensitivity would be. There seems to be quite a lot of variability in what densities and what sort of level of seed spotting occurred. And to me, that suggests that perhaps there's, a there's an interaction between the age of the pod and the likelihood that you'll get um, subsequent seed potting. So that's where we'll be going with that work. We'll be looking at putting myriads on different age pods. Um, we'll probably also look at, at buds and flowers to see whether they contributing to abortion there.
but um, looking at what that interaction is. And just lastly, I just wanted to put this slide up. There's quite a lot of uh, discussion about these raised blistery lumps on the pods. Um, there was, you know, quite a few people thought that was probably thrips and that was probably a good enough reason to control thrips in the crop. Um, this is not caused by insects. This is what's called an edema and it's caused by wetting and drying. Um, it's, uh, if, you cut, if you cut through these oedema, they go no further than the very surface of the pod. So I think for those of you who saw these and wondered uh, what was causing them, um, there's the answer to that question. So um, that's all I wanted to cover.